<laughs> I have been with Burning Man since the 90s. <laughs> Which is one reason why I might uh, be qualified to talk a little bit about why we do theme camps. I mean, it seems obvious to most of us, I'm sure, those of us who spend so much of our heart and soul doing this, but apparently not everyone has gotten the memo that there may be just a few pesky people out there who think that the reason that we have theme camps is so that they can get tickets, so that they can get early arrival, so that they can get their friends' awesome placement, without really understanding the role of what the theme camp does for the community. So I'm going to step back and get a little philosophical here, and a little historical, and I'm going to go all the way back to, okay, 1993. <laughs> Christmas camp generally recognizes the first theme camp. I don't know. We'll decide if it really was or not. Um, a couple of uh, my fellow cacophonists, that's uh, Peter Doty in the Santa suit, and that's uh, the lovely Lisa Archer there in the, uh, in the elfin red dress. Um, you got to understand that, that the reason initially for doing something like this was just because that's just the way we rolled. Uh, back in the days of the Cacophony Society, uh, we were all about taking over spaces and turning them into something else, right? Creating a, some kind of a weird experience, situation, environment, whether it was turning a BART train car into a karaoke lounge, uh, or, or turning a, the elevator and a parking structure into a theater for a one-act play. It was just kind of second nature for us to, and we didn't do camping or glamping, you know, we went out and we just created weird situations. Um, so that's what we did. Now. I got to thinking about it when I looked at this picture. Would Christmas camp get placed today? <laughs> so I kind of went through, uh, let's say, pluses and deltas, right? So do my own evaluation. And I'm trying to imagine that I'm doing this as a placer, which means that I'm, I'm sleep deprived. This is like the thousandth application that I've looked at. <clears throat> but I, I will look at it and say, well, they're definitely visually engaging. They uh, uh, definitely have curb appeal, you know, you know, it's pretty obvious what's going on, that this is a, uh, a theme camp. They have their interactive space right, uh, right up front, uh, lots of interactivity, 24-7, those goddamn Christmas carols never <laughs> stopped. Um, and even when they ran out of Christmas cookies, they still had some old, old fruitcake that they would, uh, they would give you if you wanted some, some really ancient heirloom fruitcake. Uh, gifting, gifting was definitely going on, they were, they were giving away, uh, giving away Eggnog, kind of warm. <laughs> Eggnog. We, we, were, we weren't really good at it, we weren't really good at refrigeration back then, uh, and definitely very, very, very neighborly. Um, in fact, you couldn't really get rid of them. They they were bringing Christmas to you. I got to understand the, the the level of irony in here. Uh, in Cacophony, Christmas was not our favorite holiday. Typically, in the regular year, we celebrated Twelfth Night. What's the significance of Twelfth Night? It's the day when Christmas is over. So we'd always have a Twelfth Night party. Anyway. On the, uh, on the Delta side, uh, no shade, really. Uh, no parking. <laughs> well, that was a problem with all the camps back then. No boundaries. Did you notice that Peter is standing right in front of his tent? That was a problem that we all worked through initially, right? Uh, uh, in the first year that I did a bar, the bar was actually attached to the VW microbus that my wife and I were sleeping in. Not ideal, right? We hadn't figured out that, that, that idea of delineating public space from private space. Uh, no health permit, <laughs> yeah. Uh, very, very moopy. I think there's pieces of tinsel still drifting around. Last time I went up to Black Rock Springs, I found a piece of tinsel that's probably from that tree. Uh, and I got to say, now the concept is tired. Not because of them, but because of that other Santa Claus thing. Santa Con, yeah, which actually, th that, that actually came after this. So they, they, they ripped off Christmas camp, not the other way around. <laughs> So um, the next year, 1994, my friends and I decided to do a, a, a little camp we call Tiki Camp. Um, I think, I don't know, I'm a little, maybe I'm bragging, I think this is the first real theme camp because it was the first place that you really wanted to stay, that you wanted to actually like hang out. Um, so we had a bar, we had shade. Uh, I think that's the first, uh, uh, um, what do they call those monkey huts now? The little Quonset structure, my wife and uh, my friend came up with that. Um, and we knew it was a success because people didn't want to leave. <laughs> so. And I, th I still think that's a good benchmark of theme camp success, right? Eve, they want to spend the whole weekend there? Okay. We didn't know it at the time, but we had actually stumbled onto something uh, that urban planners call the third place. Yeah, we're going to get all urban planny now, right? But in, in community design and community planning, uh, the third place is that place that you go to hang out and have fun, right? It's not work. It's not home. It's that other place you go to, right? So it could be the bar, the restaurant the mall, the, the church basement, whatever it is, right? Um, when we were building a city, we didn't really have that, 
right? Uh, the very early years of Burning Man, back before we had streets or anything else, we just had where you lived. It was just still a camp, right? Um, and where you worked, you know, we were starting to develop work crews and volunteer teams. But uh, that role of the third place is pretty essential when you think about it, right? That's where, that's where the magic happens. That's where relationships get built. That's where newbies become sophomores, right, and decide to come back. So pretty uh, essential to the fabric of the city. I actually looked this up, and this pulled this out of a textbook, and if this doesn't sound like a successful team camp to you, I don't know what it is, right? Free or inexpensive, welcoming and comfortable, status leveling, meaning everybody's welcome there, right? It's not a, uh, oh, I can't afford to go in that place, or uh, who, who let this guy in, right? It's everybody gets to go in. Um, critical, mix of regulars and newcomers, right? It's a place where you go to hang out with your friends, but also where you meet new people, where those newbies are welcome, where they get to become not newbies anymore. Uh, food or drink a plus, conversation, Playful atmosphere, it's your home away from home. So those of you who are doing this, I give you the third place award. It's really important. It's really important. I was talking with Harley the other day, and she said something I had to write down. She said, if it's a theme camp, really a theme camp, it is Burning Man, not just a place you go back to after you've been to Burning Man. So once again, it's that idea that if, if your theme camp is really rocking it, it's the place that people don't want to leave, where you don't want to leave where your newbies, you have to kick them out and say, get out there and see some Burning Man. It's not all here, right? But I, that's the way I've, I've looked at it for a while. I got tired of FOMO many years ago. I, I don't fear missing out. I, I like to stay still and let Burning Man come to me. That's one of the reasons I still do a theme camp. Um, another interpretation of that would be to throw all 10 principles at you. And we could spend some time here and we could figure out how each one of those uh, applies to the world of doing a theme camp. You've got to understand, when Larry sat down and wrote these, he was observing the community as it was, and what he was looking at was a lot of theme camps, right? Um, but three in particular that I do want to call out that I think are really super essential to creating a great interactive experience, radical inclusion, gifting, and participation. I can't say it enough, but it's all about welcoming the stranger, right? And any camp that's not laid out physically, emotionally, uh, logistically, to bring in new people, you're, you're not doing it. It's not a party for you and your friends, it's a party for the whole playa, right? Uh, gifting. It doesn't have to be uh, something that's wrapped up and got a ribbon on it, but, but every good theme camp is a gift of some sort, right? It's providing an experience, it's providing an environment, it's providing, if nothing else, a, a great space for people to come together, right? That's the gift. That's why we get a little bit of, uh, get some privileges, right? In exchange for that, for providing that gift that's why we get access to tickets and so forth. And finally, participation. And this is something I, I, I think that um, a lot of people maybe don't necessarily get, but, but interactivity has to be something that's shared by your entire camp. It can't be just like, okay, that's the interactive squad, right? So everyone, whether they're a special guest or whether they're a VIP or whatever, everybody has to be in on this game and everybody has to share that. Otherwise, it's not gonna work. Speaking about interactivity, um, just a couple of sort of quick pointers about how to design your interactivity um, based on, on feedback I've gotten from a lot of people. First, plan for the whole week, obviously. Think about the whole day and the whole week. Um, the most successful interactivity plans are the ones that work when you're not up, when you're not there. Um, my bar at, uh, at Campo Misterioso, we don't pour all the time. And usually by Thursday, we've run out of booze anyway, and it turns into re-gifting at that point, right? But we, we have a sign, we don't have a closed sign, we have a sign that says, we're not pouring right now, but you're welcome to come in and enjoy the lounge, right? So the lounge is always open. The piano is always there for somebody to go and hopefully not play chopsticks or night, night and, heart and soul on. Anything else is good except chopsticks and heart and soul. Um, but, it's the, you know, but anything that, that, that provides an opportunity for people to do something when you're not there or when you're not up to hosting it is great, right? So different levels of activity activity across the course of the week, super important when people are looking at your application. Involving your whole camp, like I said. You know, if you are a welcoming place, everybody has to understand they're part of the welcome wagon, right? And that's something that I've seen not necessarily, I've, I've seen that not necessarily work out the way I'd like it to work out in a, in a few cases, where not everybody understands what's going on, that, that it is, there is a public space and there is interactivity. Uh, think differently, try not to do the same thing you did last year. Uh, necessarily cut and paste, always try to up your game. And if you can think of something that's on theme for that year's theme, that's always a plus. That always rises to the top of the stack when people are looking at applications. Anybody doing anything renaissance-y this year? Renaissance, you bringing the renaissance? Okay. Uh, also, when you're building a machine, 
Excellent. We are building a machine, too. Do you see the diagrams of uh, the artist's concept of what the man's going to look like this year? Yes. Rotating man, spinning man. Terrible idea. <laughs> Terrible idea. I'm, I apologize in advance. Sorry about that. Um, so, wow, OK. So I just talked about that. I'm one slide off. Describing your interactivity. Also, when you fill out your application, just try to keep in mind that these poor, overworked placers who are looking at, you know, many, 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 many applications, try to make it easy for them, right? So anything, you, the questionnaires, right? Anything you can, anything, anything you can do in your, in your questionnaire, thank you, to make it clear, right? Uh, so we've seen occasionally people use a little too much jargon, acronyms, reference to other events or to other festival culture, just speak in English. Uh, be careful with names. Name dropping really doesn't get you anywhere. And don't assume that people know who your hot DJ is or who your yoga teacher is or anything like that. Um, and please don't just cut and paste from last year. Oh, it's always worth sitting down with your campmates and saying, what can we do better? Right? The, the bar keeps going up. Burning Man keeps getting bigger. It keeps getting better. And we got to keep up with that, with the pace of that. Uh, ultimately, it's, it's about how do you want to be remembered. Uh, uh, if, if theme camps are very often the place where people have a focused memory of a particular year of Burning Man. You want to be that camp. You want to be that one that people say, remember that year at that camp? That's what you want. So that's all I got. <laughs>